Um, I promised that I would not, even though we got started late, it's, there's a lot to do by the end of the day. So I promised to end this on the accepted time, which means I'd really like, we've got 11 minutes, that's all, but I would like to take some questions, please. Address them to, who, to whomever you like, because I would like to give the panel at least a couple minutes to, to, to respond. It's been um, a very rich conversation, but it's hard to draw a theme. So, Igor, please, can, can, can we? Perfect. And then after that, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. My question goes to Mr. Rabinovich. <clears throat> we were made to believe that without a Russian army, Assad is dead. No regime, no, no, no power, nothing. So what, hap what happens now when the uh, Russians' hands are full in, in, in another war? And what happens on the Turkish-Iranian confrontation there and Kur <coughs> Kurdish question? Okay. Uh, um, Igor, to, to your right there. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks to the panelists for this, uh, these wonderful presentations. I would ha like to have a very short comment on what's happening in the Middle East today. As I, th I see it as a very contrasted situation. On the one hand, you have the Abraham Accords that have triggered such, such a tremendous change in the area. And we're witnessing uh, an unseen cooperation uh, between Israel and the, in the countries of the, area, of the region. On the other hand, we have still questions that are unsettled. May I remind you that we have the Palestinian issue, the Lebanese issue, the Syrian issue, sure. the Yemeni issue, the Iraqi issue that are, um, that are just uh, pending, if I might say. So my question would go to ask uh, the honorable panelists here, um, about one thing that is very much worrisome. As Mona has rightly tackled, um, pointed out too, we are witnessing the regionalization of Middle East. The intervention of the superpower or the so-called superpower is no longer here. I mean, the fading uh, presence of Russia, even of the United States, of course, the obsolete uh, maybe a uh, role of, of, of Russia in the years to come. So what is very much uh, um, worrisome is the fact that in this region, we have no regional institutions that might br or may bring about a kind of settlement of all these conflicts. Right. I mean, uh, you, you have the European Union, Question. you have the ASEAN, you have the NATO, but in this region, which power, from your point of view, is the one that might be able right. to, to bring about a change or a settlement of the, in this Perfect. region? Thank, Thank you. you so much. There's, there's another question, I think, from my Japanese colleague back there. <coughs> yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Hiro Akita from Tokyo. Tokyo. My question is about the Arab uh, state's relation with Russia. I understand that the uh, Arab state uh, have been taking a balance, balancing behavior between U uh, West and Russia. But the, my question is, as Russian uh, military situation uh, get more and more deteriorated in Ukraine, uh, will, will it affect the Arab country's distance with Russia? Uh, uh, yeah, that is okay. my question, thank you. Perfect, and last question, Jim Bitterman. Jim, stand up so they can find you. Uh, it's just a question for, for the panel in general. I mean, it seems to me there's an inherent contradiction. It's a great panel. It's a great discussion. But when you start off talking about hyperpragmatism and move on to polygamy, um, uh, and then the desire for stability, uh, those of us in the room with a certain age have a sort of a fondness, nostalgia for NATO and for these institutions, these grand institutions that come along. So how do you square that circle? How, how is it that you can have stability by making hyper-pragmatic deals and, and uh, having multiple lovers? Thank you. It's a very good question. So listen, I'm afraid we're not going to have tons of time, so I'm going to go back to the panel, ask each of you to respond as you like for no more than two minutes, please. You've got the clock. Also, you can see it. So let's please keep to the time. Okay. Over to you. And right. apologies for not getting back to you sooner. Oh, that's all right. 
uh, about Syria. Now, the situation in Syria, I think when and if the Russians sort of recede, uh, it, it creates a new constellation. And that constellation could work to sort of put the pieces together because there are two things, Syria's territorial integrity and not having Iran in Syria. Those two things can actually align quite a few um, uh, actors on the field. I think the US, uh, I think Turkey, what remains of Russia, Russian presence, those can be aligned. And when I talked about Turkey not engaging in a war in Syria, what I meant is that Turkey will not be, it will not be in sort of an outright war, mm -hmm. but what is very clear and consistent and continuous from the beginning it does, is that Turkey insists on the security of its southern border. Right. And so we have these sort of uh, sporadic incursions to ensure that. And what is pragmatic about Erdogan's president, Erdogan's approach, is that he waits for the timing when the stars are aligned for, to find the point of least resistance. And I think we are very close to that point of least resistance Great. because of the reasons I mentioned. That is one thing. I still have 45 seconds. And the second one <laughs> is with the hyper uh, pragmatism, I think, yes, you're absolutely right. It is very difficult to hold it together. Now that we have sort of some room for maneuver, uh, because of the oil prices, because of Turkey, because of the Ukrainian situation, creating some room for Turkey, for a while this can work. But I think in the long run it cannot. And this is a phase, and we will go back to the first search for stability. And that is why I think it is very critical that the Europeans don't feel that they're being left out of a fast bargain game. They should just sort of hold on to their guns. Their time will come. They should, we should not lose credibility in the European ability for structures. Thank you. Thank you, Mamdou. That was good. Gilles. Well, one, uh, one thing I was uh, sorry, I mean, you speak up. Uh, well, yeah, why don't you borrow that? Perfect. Is it better? Yes. Fine. Uh, answering in an attempt to answer uh, Joe Mela's uh, question, I wonder whether what remains of, um, of, a, lo of a regional institution, uh, the only one that remains to some extent is the GCC. And I would like, of course, I would turn to Abdelaziz for more, uh, more comments. Uh, after we, everybody considered that the GCC was dead and buried uh, because of the Qatar blockade. This has ended for a number of reasons that many, people, many of you know about. And um, when, uh, when she came to, to the region, he, uh, he, went, he came to Saudi Arabia. Uh, all, the, all the regional powers or non-powers gathered to Saudi Arabia and f seen from China, the place where everybody was uh, summoned, quote unquote, or whistled to, to come was, was the Arabian Peninsula. So to, to a large extent, uh, the, um, the sort of the, uh, the financial center of, uh, of the region is more and more becoming its political center. And because particularly in a time when resources are scarce, where uh, the price of commodities is uh, growing, where hyperinflation is coming, uh, the position of power of this part of the, of the region is uh, significantly increasing. So that would be my gut feeling, but I'll, I'd like to have the, to not from the, the horse's mouth, I don't say you're a horse, of course. Uh, <laughs> The the Aziz, but uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, Femmel uh, Hassan. Okay, Mona, please. I also would like to answer Joe Myla's uh, question. Uh, we do have institutions. One of them, which is the main one, which is the Arab League, is unfortunately impotent, and the only one we can look at is again the GCC, which we thought that it was. Mm, the most Dead. resembling, let's say, to the European Union. So we do hope that they will continue to do so. But what I want to say is that the main thing that exists, and nobody spoke about it so much, is the need from people of the region to have religious institutions be changed, be more pragmatic, be more... Uh, uh, to
to have a, a dialogue that um, President Sisi had asked for four years ago, a reform of the religious dialogue. And this is not happening, unfortunately. And another thing is that the um, extremism, Islamist extremism, is very well entrenched in many of the uh, societal institutions in Egypt in particular. Okay. Thank you. Itamar, okay. uh, To Igor's uh, question, I think Turkey will, first of all, Turkey is practically annexed about 8% of, of Syria. It will continue to hold this territory. Let's bear in mind that Turkey is the one preventing Russia and Syria from conquering the Idlib, the province of Idlib, in which you still have 50,000 jihadis. Um, Turkey doesn't want an attack on Idlib because it will send another million refugees into Turkish territory. So it will remain involved in a big way. As for the uh, Im impact of a potential reduction of Russia's presence in uh, Syria, uh, there is a very close Iranian-Russian relationship now in Syria and in Ukraine, and the, the more or the, the greater the decline of Russian presence and influence in Syria, the greater that of, of Iran. The difference is that Russia wants influence in Syria, Iran wants to penetrate Syria, to, to turn the, the country in a very deep and a very profound way. Briefly to Jim Bitterman's uh, question, I'm afraid I see more instability because there's another factor at work, which is population explosion. Uh, 320 million people in the Arab world today, numbers are growing, mostly in the non-rich uh, Arab countries, and this would create further instability in years to come. And they're very young. Besides. Maybe I don't need to. Uh, Abdelaziz. Okay, please. yeah, is it okay like this? Fine. Yes. Um, let me answer by two things. I think in January 20. 21, when we had the GCC summit in Al Ula, I think it was clearly stated that we resolve a lot of the dispute differences that have occurred between the Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain, and Qatar. And I'm so happy as a Gulf citizen to see the relation is back to normal, even better. The last week we've witnessed the visit of His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed to uh, uh, Qatar. We have seen um, you know, Prince Mohammed bin Salman, the Crown Prince, being in Qatar for the World Cup, uh, for the uh, uh, you know, uh, opening ceremony. So that's also make us feel what brings us together more than the different. Now, in terms of regional security, there are several initiatives, which include the US Mesa, which include the Russian Mesa was rejected by the Iranian because they felt it was against them. The Russian was rejected by the American. Russia initiative was rejected by the American. The Iranian was rejected by the region because the Iranian initiative, although it's based in non-intervention, non-aggression, but they, want to, they don't want to ignore the past and just deal from today and on. They don't want to deal with Hezbollah, with the interventionists in Syria. And by the way, in Syria, because of the Israeli military attack on the Iranian presence in Syria, that have reduced the Iranian capability since the beginning to almost 20% today. They don't talk about it, the Israeli, neither the, the Iranian they talk about it, but it is reality on the ground. And the Russians are providing clear rules of engagement in terms of military action from the Israeli against the Iranian presence in Syria. Now, we understand from a national security point of view the, the Turkish interest in North Syria because in no way we will support a separatist group like the PKK because we have a, also a serious situation here in the region if we do so. But we hope that will end soon and the Turk will just you know, try to finish it as fast as possible. On the, on the other initiative also, we have the Chinese now coming up with the initiative. We, you know, but still, that Chinese initiative, we're not so sure that it works. So we have the American, the Russian, the Iranian, the Chinese, and the European. But the European focus on maritime security. What we need in any initiative in the region, three preconditions. Inclusiveness, so we need to include Israel, Iran, Turkey. We cannot exclude any one of these three. Second, we need to have the guarantor, first we need, to, we, we need to resolve the current problem in the region. We can't go into a security architecture in the region and we have the, uh, 
militia supported by Russia and Libya, and we have the militia in Iraq supported by the Iranians. So we need to resolve current problem in the region, and then we need to have the guarantor. And the guarantor cannot be only the UN. So we need the, the Security Council plus the UN and find the right formula of the sort of guarantor that can be provided to have a better security architecture. But by the way, look at the difference. We called the Jeddah summit, which was attended by President Biden, development and security. Here, we did not call it security with the Chinese. We called it development and sustainability. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. And if I may, just for one second, let me thank Tiali, Song Lim, the organizers, the hosts, and especially the translators who have been working their butts off and done a, such a wonderful job. So as you applaud the panel, please applaud the translators also. <laughs> <laughs>